2006 Ball Convocation of Case Western Reserve University is hereby convened. Please remain standing for the national anthem, which will be led by Speakeasy. Please be seated. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Interim President Gregory L. Eastwood. Welcome to the fall faculty convocation and uh, this uh, beginning, official beginning of the academic year, although the students and faculty will attest that it's already well on its way. Joining me on stage today are many of our campus leaders uh, seated in the second row from my right are Mae Weichel, Dean of the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing, Charles Rosick, School of Graduate Studies, Gary Simpson, School of Law, our newest uh, dean, um, Jeffrey Wolkowitz, Undergraduate Studies. Gerald, I'm sorry, Cyrus Taylor, College of Arts and Sciences. Gerald Goldberg, School of Dental Medicine. Cleve Gilmore, Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences. And Mohan Reddy, Weatherhead School of Management. Seated in the front row from my right are Jay Henderson, the representative of the Postdoctoral Researchers Association. Catherine Howard, Chair of the Staff Advisory Council. Jay Alexander, Chair of the Faculty Senate. John Anderson, Provost and University Vice President. Franklin Salata, Chair of the Board of Trustees. Robin Dubin, University Marshal. Michael Ruhlman, author of The Common Reading, Soul of a Chef. Glenn Nichols, Vice President of Student Affairs. Neil Ursick, President of the Undergraduate Student Government, and Liz Olson, Graduate Student Senate. I also want to acknowledge our emeriti and current faculty, officers, and students who joined the academic procession today. A special welcome to the emeritus faculty. And I, additionally, I welcome our students and staff and alumni and friends. And finally, in the recognitions, I'd like to recognize the family and friends of Michael Ruhlman. Could you just raise your, raise your hands to your family and friends so we know where you are? Oh, there you are, up there. Of course, prime seating. Welcome. When students uh, return in the fall, the common question is, what did you do this summer? Let me tell you what I did this summer. <laughs> I had a busy summer. <laughs> I started here as interim president on June 2nd, and I'm very grateful for that opportunity to uh, serve my alma mater. I, if you don't know, I'm a graduate of the medical school here uh, four decades ago. <laughs> uh, so it's an honor for me to be here and to serve as your interim president. Over the past few months, uh, I've continued my exploration of this wonderful campus and the city as well, the headlines of the Plain Dealer notwithstanding. 
I have enjoyed uh, barbecue lunches on the Crawford Plaza. I've listened to staff and faculty and students, uh, uh, both outside the office, and then I have open office hours every week. I've met with alumni and community leaders and other people, both in Cleveland and at some locations around the country. My wife, Lynn, who's sitting up in the middle of the balcony there, and I are delighted to live in Harcourt House. As some of you know, that's the president's residence over in, on Harcourt <coughs> Road in uh, Cleveland Heights. At first, we thought we were too small for that big house, but now we're big enough for that house. We have, <laughs> it's a variant of Parkinson's Law, I think. You just expand to fill the space available. Uh, we've also enjoyed the community, which includes uh, a couple of visits to the City Club for noon uh, talks by notables. Uh, invitation and accepted invitation uh, to the Cleveland Indians baseball game, and we won that night. Uh, a couple of trips to Blossom Festival, uh, which is just a sampling of the uh, many varieties of uh, cultural and other activities that are available. And I mention these things not only to share with you my enthusiasm for being here and participating, but to suggest to those of you. Uh, students and faculty who are new, and maybe some of the experienced ones, that these are things you may want to revisit. It's uh, fitting that we begin this year with a speaker who is part of our community, Michael Ruhlman, and you have uh, read, uh, or at least you know of his book. Uh, just to tell you how I read books, you may not have to be too far-sighted to know that this whole area is filled up with my writing. And that's how, uh, Lynn will tell you that that's how I go through books and I make notes and so on. I did that with this book. That means it's a good book. Um, one of the important aspects of a strong community is nourishment. Uh, nourishment of a number of, uh, explicitly this is about nourishment of the body, but anyone who knows the book knows that it's nourishment of the soul. This is an opportunity to uh, take part in the common reading together and to think and engage in this common activity and discussions. And it's also a, uh, an opportunity to think about the environment here at Case Western Reserve University. This uh, for the students is not the beginning, but an important part of the journey, your life's journey of self-discovery. This is a journey that takes your whole life. I'm still discovering things about myself. Most of them okay, some not. Uh, but also it's in a, an environment which we hope is secure and we hope is diverse. Diverse with respect to ethnicity, diverse with respect to gender issues, diverse with respect to tolerance and res respect for other people. And I hope that uh, we can all reap the benefits of such a diverse uh, multi-dimensional uh, campus. Before I turn the uh, podium over to uh, Michael, uh, I'm going to just uh, give you a little extemporaneous uh, account of the last hour or so that I've spent with him. It's been marvelous. We sat for uh, close to an hour in my office talking, and um, I was surprised that the hour had passed. We uh, shared some common experiences. Uh, more, I was listening to him. Uh, and uh, he is a writer. He is uh, what I understand from reading about other writers. Uh, writers have to write. Uh, they need to write. And uh, I don't know whether he'll talk about that or, or not. I shared with him a little bit of my own interest in writing you know, on a much smaller and uh, focused scale, but some of the joy and the expression that uh, comes from that. And an interesting concept uh, among several that emerged from that discussion, uh, he, he said, and I resonate with this, that you don't really know your thoughts until you write. You get them down at sort of a positive feedback loop um, that tells you maybe a little bit more about yourself as you're writing. So that's enough of me talking. I'd like you to uh, welcome the author of uh, Soul of a Chef, Michael Ruhlman. Thank you, Dr. Eastwood, um, for your remarks. Uh, it's, it, it's a real honor to be here. Um, I love this city. Um, 
And I'm, I'm just so grateful to be here in front of you. It's, it's, it's such a, an exciting time at school. Fall for me has always meant the beginning of the year, um, not the beginning of the end of the year. I'm still, even though I've been out of school for years and years, I'm still on a school calendar. And so I, I think it's uh, a great and extraordinary thing that there's a convocation of this sort to, to introduce this, the, the year, to have a, a ritual to begin uh, the work of the year. Um, it's a time of promise, and so I, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you. I want to talk to you actually about, um, excuse me, I want to talk to you about a time when I, I, I didn't want to go to school and something interesting that, that came about because of it. I was attending a school that taught cooking, the Culinary Institute of America in the Hudson Valley. I was impersonating a student in order to get other students' stories. I was writing a book about what the best chef school said you had to know in order to be a chef. What did it mean to be a chef? And so I'd begun in the first kitchen skills class there was, where we learned how to peel a carrot, then an onion, then to concasse a tomato, then to make veal stock, to turn that stock into sauce. Three weeks of basics. I liked to cook, so it was fun. I loved getting to know my fellow students, the real cooks, the people who intended to go out into the cooking world and be chefs. And I was pretty good at it. It was February. We were living about 25 miles north of the CIA. And the day before the final cooking practical in this section, the most basic of courses, a blizzard hit. I did a 360 on Route 9 coming home. It was so slippery. The next morning, it was still snowing. No way was I going to make it into school. I did not want to go to school. And I didn't have to. I wasn't taking this thing for a grade. Though I'd been looking forward to it, I liked making consomme and bechamel sauce and wanted to show my chef that this was a piece of cake. And while it was potentially good material for the book, I could still write the book without it. But I wanted to make sure my chef didn't think I was blowing this off lightly. So I called him to let him know. At first, my chef, he was just 37, um, medium-sized guy from Connecticut suburbs. Um, he was accepting of my, uh, uh, of my excuse, but he couldn't hold his tongue. He said, Michael, what we're trying to teach here is part of being a chef is getting here. I said, I completely understand that, chef. That's what I'm calling about. I would be getting there, but as you can see, the Hudson Valley is closed down and I can't get there. That's fine, Michael, he said. You have your work and we have ours. I said, no, really, I want to be here. I want to do this work. And he said, we're cut from a different cloth, and that's not a bad thing. No, we aren't, I said. It's totally the same cloth. I'd be there if I could. I would. He said, what we teach here is that this is part of what makes us different. We get there. I couldn't stop pacing after I hung up. When my wife saw that I was hyperventilating, she said, don't even think about it. You are not driving. You're a writer, not a cook. But my chef, Chef Pardis, hadn't given me a choice, not really. Not if I wanted to show my face in his kitchen again. So I drove 25 miles through a blizzard to make a bechamel sauce. That was my first real cooking lesson. And it's fair to say that it changed my life. I was lazy. That's all there was to it. I heard the word lazy a lot in culinary school. Sometimes it referred to the kind of bubble you should keep your stock at, but usually it was about people. Everybody has a little bit of a lazy nature to them, one of my chefs told me matter-of-factly. Everybody does. And he was right. People are inclined toward laziness rather than work. Work is a form of order. Laziness is a form of chaos, a letting go, a falling apart. And this is what the chef said next. The most successful chefs are those who are least lazy. Sounds simple, but think about it for a second. It wasn't that the most successful chefs were those who trained under the best chefs when they were young. It wasn't that the best chefs had a talent or a genius for food. It wasn't the most successful chefs are the one with great taste imagination. It wasn't that they are the ones who are most creative or the best leaders. The best chefs are those who are least lazy. This bears out, apparently, in most forms of work. 
Many years later, I was reading a book about the work of surgery called Complications by Dr. Atal Gawande. There have now been many studies of elite performers, he writes, international violinists, chess grandmasters, professional ice skaters, mathematicians, and so forth. And the biggest difference researchers find between them, them and lesser performers is the cumulative amount of deliberate practice they've had. Indeed, the most important talent may be the talent for practice itself. They didn't like to practice any more than others, they just did it more. It's almost a joke. Excuse me, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? But it's true. The means to success, even fantastic success, is not just within our grasp, it's right in front of us. The storm changed things for me. It turned out to be one of those small points at which my life pivoted and rocketed off in a new direction that I could never have foreseen. The day I did, that day, I decided I was going to cook for real. My anger showed me the intensity of experience that cooking could bring one to. I was going to be a cook. I was going to cook for real. I was going to cook as though my livelihood depended on it. That knowledge, the knowledge of learning to cook, allowed me to write a book about cooking in a way that cooking hadn't been written about before. Furthermore, the muscles I developed in order to be a cook, the refusal to fall back on laziness and excuses, allowed me to write that book in less than four months, something, that, something I thought was impossible before I learned to cook. And it gave me an expertise in a subject that was of increasing interest in America, an expertise that few journalists had, which ensured the very useful fact that I'd be able to make money by writing about this subject. All of which, with a little bit of divine assistance, led to my hooking up with Thomas Keller, who at the time had a mystique among cooks that was unequaled. He was the monk in Yountville, California, at the mysterious, mysteriously named restaurant, The French Laundry. It was really here that food and cooking took on a, a broader meaning for me. It almost sounds frivolous to put food and cooking at the head of an agenda, what with the fiasco going on in Iraq, the threat of terrorism at home, the environment heating up. Certainly the comforts of cooking and eating, the camaraderie usually attending it is a pleasant, even necessary diversion from our troubled times. But is it more? And if so, what and why? Keller was my first real contact with excellence, a kind of platonic excellence, if you will, in that it wasn't relative to anything else. And it would allow me to make sense of this world that I'd found so compelling. He more than, he more than anyone showed me why food was about more than just food. He showed me how food and the work of preparing it for other people was about more than sustenance and sensual pleasure, that it could teach you about the things that were important in this world. I don't know for a fact where his innate quest to perfect all that he did came from, but he seemed to have it from the beginning. At his first chef's job in the early 1970s at a tiny yacht club in West Palm Beach, he had to do a lot of things every day to be ready for service. And one of those to-dos was to make a hollandaise sauce. Hollandaise is a basic emulsified sauce, a lot of fat, butter fat, vigorously whipped into a little water to create a little water and egg yolks to create a concoction of unparalleled parallel luxuriousness and richness. It takes a little skill and technique. If it gets too hot or if you lose too much water, it'll turn to soup on you in a matter of moments. Keller was a teenager. He didn't know about the importance of the water, the continuous phase and the emulsion, or the molecule in egg yolk, call, egg yolk called lecithin that helped to sustain the emul emulsion. He only knew that every now and then, when it broke, it made your life a misery. So he did what most chefs at the time did to ensure a stable sauce. He prayed to the sauce gods, be merciful, don't let my hollandaise break today. And more often than not, they didn't. And he got good at the hollandaise because basically good cooking is a matter of repetition. But here's where he did what most chefs did not do. He stalked the hollandaise every day. He wanted to make it better, richer, tastier, silkier. Perfecting the hollandaise was his goal, and more, it was the high point of his day. He never got tired of making that hollandaise sauce. It was not something to master and move on from, a chore to pass off to somebody else. 
It was something to deepen and explore every day, even in the midst of the busy struggle to be ready for service. There's that practice element of excellence. He had an endless capacity for it, practice. He had, in fact, an endless capacity to take pleasure in myriad mundane tasks that make up a cook's day, peeling asparagus, chopping shallots, turning artichokes. He loved it all. He could turn artichokes with his feet. Here's another element of his excellence. He paid attention. He watched how food behaved. He thought about what it meant. He knew that if in your preparation you were boiling milk and it boiled over, it didn't mean that you had a mess. It meant you didn't have all the milk you need in your pot. Fish was so delicate, he began to store it in ice upright in the same position it swims. He cut off the ends of his asparagus and stored them upright in water, treating them like living flowers. He figured if he was going to cook rabbit, he'd better know how to gut and skin it too. The process of killing the rabbit, though, had been so horrific for him, he realized then how important it was to cook that rabbit well, how important it was not to waste that life. And so he went out into the world and made his living as a cook, moving up the ranks to executive chef in New York, aiming to create the very best food he possibly could. High-end food, that was what he cared about and who he was. He translated his pursuit of perfect hollandaise into everything he did. But in the fall of 1987, the market plunged, and the business expense accounts in the flush Wall Street crowd vanished. His partner insisted on responding to the market by downscaling the food. Keller didn't want to do that. To diminish the food would be to lower the standards he'd been developing, starting with that hollandaise sauce. He left New York because he knew one critical fact. If I relinquish my standards, he said, it would be the end. And he paused here at the truth of it and said, it would be the end of me. He was his standards, his standards were him. To take his standards away from him would be to, to cease to be able to recognize Thomas Keller. And he continued to work really hard. Opening the French Laundry in 1994, where he would, over the course of about five years, earn his reputation as one of the best chefs in the world. His young cooks watched him, and they learned too. He peeled his own asparagus and chopped his own shallot and swept the kitchen floor. He worked harder in the already fantastically difficult labor of high-end kitchen, of a high-end kitchen. His cooks called it the push. Grant Ackett's, now a nationally revered chef in Chicago, was one of those cooks. Very few people push themselves to their limit, Grant said. Me and Eric and Gregory, we were in awe of the way Thomas pushed himself. You never question it, he continued, recalling the crushing workload of 15-hour days of high-stress labor, because Keller was doing it himself. You've got 102 reservations and 19 VIPs, and he looked at you and said, do you have time to do this new dish? You didn't even think about not saying yes. You just did it. He knew you didn't have the time. Here's something else that I learned from watching Keller. Shortly before opening his New York restaurant, per se, I think it was in 2004, Keller, responding to comments on the extravagant cost of it, said, I don't understand why America is so quick to accept mediocrity. It's true. Mediocrity surrounds us. We live in a throwaway culture. The cheaper, the better. It's what Walmart's all about. And fast food is not only a great metaphor for a cheap, disposable culture of mediocrity that is being embraced around the globe, it's a literal example of the danger of not realizing how expensive that cheapness is. As Michael Pollan writes in his excellent book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, our fast food, indeed so much of our processed food, is almost completely dependent on corn. And in our efforts to grow more corn faster, we've diminished the breeds of corn, planting only corn that grows rapidly in abundance in packed quarters to create a corn monoculture, hypertext monoculture to Irish potato famine. And the government heavily subsidizes this corn with your tax money. We then convert our fossil fuels into fertilizer to protect the monocultural corn that we've made vulnerable to increasingly resilient pests. 
and then spend more fossil fuels to cart it around the country and the world to turn that corn into everything from plastic to more fuel in the form of ethanol to countless additives we can pump into food because it's cheaper than the real stuff if you, the, if you ignore the government subsidies, the fossil fuel expense, the staggering health care dollars we spend to fix the problems caused by our crappy food. The beef in this country used to be raised on grass. Grass was free. It grew all over the place. It took energy from the sun, energy that was free, and gave it to the cow who turned it into protein. Now we feed corn to that cow. Government subsidized, monocultural, fossil fuel dependent, environment endangering, farmer impoverishing corn, which cows as ruminants don't normally eat. Therefore, we have to pump them full of antibiotics because in the overcrowded, polluted environment they live in, they otherwise get sick and die. These antibiotics and growth hormones, grow them bigger, faster, forever, are believed to remain in the muscle and milk that we and our kids eat. We raise the animals in concentrated feedlots. No grass in sight, just a lot of other cows and lakes of animal waste. If a cow from 50 years ago came back now to see what their offspring were up to, they'd probably collapse from anguish. Chickens and hogs, the same thing. They're being raised in virtual factories, raised on government subsidized corn. And the waste that results is polluting in massive ways the very country they're meant to feed. You know the phrase, don't shit where you eat? Well, that's what we're doing in this country. The pollution is so bad, the flood of nitrogen from animal waste and chemical fertilizers is so vast, it's the main cause of dead zones in the ocean. Water so depleted of oxygen and nutrients that nothing can live in it. And those parts of the ocean that are so vital, that are still vital, pretty soon those will be fished out as well. So can we say writing about food is frivolous in these times? That chefs don't have anything to tell us more than how to get food on the table in 30 minutes? Is it valuable to revel in a great meal in troubling times or to write about the wonders of, say, the farmer's market, our farmer's market right here, the North Union farmer's market? I can buy the most wonderful asparagus, oyster mushrooms, spring onions, eggs, fresh eggs, eggs I can eat raw because there's no fear of salmonella bacteria that now pollutes our agri-chickens. I can make a great omelet filled with those sauteed mushrooms and blanched asparagus with some butter made nearby at Hartzler's Dairy. I can cook one of things for you and you will be weak in the knees. It's so simple and good. Is that about hedonism? Is it frivolous, selfish, short-sighted? Food is the most important thing there is after water, and we are trashing it in this country on a massive scale. We are not thinking. We are not paying attention. We are raising cows in ways that make them sick. We've debased the once great hog, and I'll pun here to keep things light, we've fouled our chickens. They are actually trying to breed hogs without fat and chickens without feathers. I'm not kidding. We've overfished and killed our oceans, and we're burning holes in the atmosphere. How we eat determines how we live. How we eat and the decisions we make about it shape the world. Humans are a nasty predator on this earth. So far, we've managed to avoid the ecological disasters of our own predation, but not for long, not if we're lazy, not if we don't pay attention. I don't mean to be completely gloomy. Great food is still available, and the number of farmers growing it sustainably, humanely, and well is growing. Great chefs like Keller are training scores more young chefs. One torch becomes 20. Food connects us to the earth in this digital, internet -y age, keeps us grounded in things that matter. Great cooking in the end has real power because it connects us to our past, our future, and all of humanity if we let it. I believe that America's increasing appetite for food and cooking know-how is in part the beginning of a spiritual quest for the bigger things, a search for meaning, order, and beauty in an apparently chaotic and alienating universe. Res resisting mediocrity is hard, 
Mediocrity presses in on us. America is a mediocrity factory. Don't accept it. Work harder. Take the hardest way possible. The advancement of our species and the health of our world depends on our being smart, on working harder, on our pushing ourselves to seek excellence and truth, truth rather than the false truths like fast food is cheap. It doesn't begin by going out and putting agribusiness out of business or running for senator. It begins when you determine to perfect the Hollandaise. That's where it begins. That's what I've learned. When 10 million or 100 million people learn to perfect whatever kind of holidays they happen to be working on, are obsessed with, are practicing, things change, life pivots. I've also learned this, and take it as a personal word of advice, especially you students, and we're all students. If you ever get the chance to drive 25 miles through a blizzard to make a bechamel sauce, take it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for pointing out the not-so-obvious truth that the soul of a chef is very closely related to the soul of a responsible and engaged citizen. And it's my pleasure to recognize students who have recognized that connection and have extended and enhanced their education through engagement in community service and leadership. The contributions of our students to the community over this past year have been remarkable. Students have raised funds for nonprofit organizations, They've built houses for the homeless, provided tutoring and mentoring, and they've supported Greater Cleveland citizens in many other ways. Their contributions have received well-deserved local, national, and international attention. And we don't have nearly enough time to begin to describe all of their contributions, but I would like to share with you just a few examples. Cases, fraternities, and sororities provided over 10,000 hours of service to nearly 100 community organizations and their ongoing commitment to provide at least 365 days of service annually. Hundreds of student volunteers worked with Habitat for Humanity to complete CASE's fourth case-sponsored and funded house. Alpha Phi Omega raised funds for a variety of organizations, including the National Marfan Foundation. The Center for Civic Engagement and Learning developed a program called CASE Serves to offer students regular opportunities to serve the local community. Students volunteered 375 hours on topics related to the environment, hunger, homelessness, and education. Global Medical Initiative students traveled to impoverished communities in Guyana and provided direct service as, long, as well as medical supplies. Engineering student, students engaged with groups like Engineers Without Borders and Engineering World Health. Nursing students spent literally thousands of hours in clinical service placements in Greater Cleveland. Students in the Mandel School of Applied Social Science spent well over 125,000 hours in social service agencies last year. And if you stop and think about that, that's the equivalent of more than 60 full-time employees. All of the students in the School of Dentistry served the community through their participation in the Healthy Smiles Sealant Program. And students working with the National Youth Service Program in athletics provided hundreds of school children with meaningful recreational and educational experiences. I could describe many more cases of students driving through the storm to become engaged, but I won't do that. Let's recognize these and other students for their service to the community. Our campus is also blessed with many outstanding student leaders and with organizations that give them the opportunity to develop those leadership skills. Again, I can only mention a small sample. Representatives from nearly 70 departments across the university work together in the Graduate Student Senate to represent the needs of graduate students. 
Undergraduate class officers sponsored the fourth annual Halloween at the university farm, something that grew from 150 participants in its first year to over 3,000 participants this past year. Greek organizations develop leaders who are recognized both on our campus and across the country for their leadership. And both our Panhellenic and IFC won multiple awards at their national conferences. Orientation leaders this year welcomed a very large group of new undergraduates to CASE and provided the energy and guidance necessary for good programs. Student residence life staff provided over 500 programs to our students last year. They welcomed over 1,000 new first-year students to the uh, residence halls, and they were joined by 2,000 upper-class students returning to our residential villages. Undergraduate student government recognized and funded over 100 organizations. The program board continues to bring us wonderful traditional events like the Hudson Relays and Spring Fest. Our athletic teams demonstrated leadership both on and off the field, including several All-Americans and an NCAA postgraduate scholarship winner. Case Engineers Council continued to provide leadership for the annual Engineers Week, as well as a technology day for local high state school students. KCMS completed their first full year of operation as a student EMS squad, providing first responder care to the campus and providing first aid stations at large events. The Emerging Leaders Program provided a year-long training and development program for dozens of first-year students. Case Debate maintained its top 20 national ranking, and Case Model UN continued to win national awards. In an era too often marked by shrinking horizons and growing fear, the university was a true shining city on a hill, hill with over 1,000 students from other countries expanding our horizons and helping us to grow hope that this world can be a place where humans can thrive. Join me in recognizing these students for their leadership and service. And it's my privilege to introduce one student who has demonstrated his leadership over the past two years, the president of undergraduate student government, Neil Ersick. Thank you, Vice President Nichols, and thank all of you for allowing me the honor to speak with you. Today we gather to celebrate this new academic year, to look ahead and also to remember our past, because it is not only the university that is shaped by its past, so too are the people who make it up. In 1826 in Hudson, Ohio, what was then the Western Reserve College welcomed its first class. Unlike today, they had no history to look back upon, no former accomplishments to celebrate, no welcome days or orientation, and they most certainly didn't convene in a location as magnificent as Severance Hall. The class was four students in total, unlike the 1,031 of this year's class of 2010. The dissimilarities between the class of 2010 and that of 1826 are many, but one commonality that they share is the caliber of students. Throughout the history of Case Western Reserve University, through the changes in the university's location, name, facilities, and so much more, what has remained constant is the gifted, bright, and talented students who make up this university. Such past gifted students have gone on to be Nobel Prize winners, CEOs of major corporations, film writers, and even a coach of the Miami Dolphins. Each one of these notable alums sat where you are at convocation, and afterwards, at some point in their four years, they decided to seize a chance that granted them the opportunity to become who they are today. But unlike all of us, these individuals didn't have the access to the resources that we have. So what will be said about the class of 2010? Will the person to the right or left of you become a Nobel Prize winner? Will he or she discover a cure for cancer or make major advancements in fuel cell research? The answer is likely yes. You see, by becoming a part of the case community, we have all been granted access to opportunities and experiences that will help us achieve great things. But it is up to us to actively seek out and involve ourselves in the community around to attain such accomplishments. If you wish to be great at all, you must begin where you are and with what you are. If you want to be great anywhere, you must first be great in your own here at Case. So get involved, get excited, 
and get ready for great things. Thank you and welcome to a new year and a new case. Now please join me in welcoming Speakeasy back to the stage to lead us in singing the alma mater. You're, you will find the lyrics printed on the back of your program. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our convocation. You are all invited to a reception and book signing in the tent on Freiburger Field, which is behind Severance Hall. Please remain standing at your seats until the academic procession has left the hall. 